Major funding for this series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, by public television stations, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over a hundred years providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers. Additional funding is provided by the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. This program contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. America made a commitment to South Vietnam and to its president, Ngo Dinh Diem, in the 1950s under President Eisenhower. Mr. President, it is a great joy for me to be again in Washington and a great honor to be welcomed by you. I thank you very much. By late 1963, Diem was dead the U.S. government implicated in his downfall. This is the story of the beginning of America's war in Vietnam. Now let us assume that we lose in New China. If Indochina goes, several things happen right away. Uh, the Crop Peninsula, the last little bit of end hanging on down there would be scarcely defensible. The tin and the tungsten that we so greatly value from that area would cease coming. But all India would be outflanked. Burma would certainly, in its weakened condition, be no defense. So you see, somewhere along the line, this must be blocked must be blocked now. And that's what the French are doing. So when the United States votes $400 million to help that war, we're not voting for a giveaway program. We're voting for the cheapest way that we can prevent the occurrence of something that would be of the most terrible significance to the United States of America, our security. America had given France more than $2 billion to stop the communist-led Viet Minh in Indochina. But in 1954, after eight years of war and a hundred years of colonial rule, the French were defeated. The Geneva ceasefire agreement imposed a temporary division of Vietnam. The French could retain their influence in the south. A communist regime headed by Ho Chi Minh took over the north. To many Vietnamese, the Viet Minh were nationalist heroes finally victorious in the long war against the French, finally in control of their capital city, Hanoi. To America's leaders, Ho Chi Minh represented international communism directed by Moscow. And after China's fall to the communists only five years before, they saw Ho's victory as another threat to the West. I saw everywhere that there were people who were frightened and worried at the evidence, either when they're in their own country or in very close proximity to it, of aggressive Chinese communist intentions. It would seem as though it was quite possible that the Chinese communists are not content to stop until it is apparent that they are stopped by superior resistance. In the South, American hopes for building an anti-communist state centered on Ngo Dinh Diem, a little-known nationalist appointed prime minister during the Geneva Conference. Diem had disliked French rule. Now he was inheriting their shaky bureaucracy, a demoralized army, and a capital, Saigon, seething with fierce political rivalries. He also faced a two-year deadline. The Geneva Agreements called for countrywide elections in 1956. If Ho Chi Minh won, the communists would control all of Vietnam. The Eisenhower administration was uncertain about Diem. 
Could he rally the southern population and stop the spread of communism? C'était en fin août 1954. It was the end of August 1954, a month and a half after my brother Ziem had come to power. I arrived in Saigon to find that my brother couldn't count on his government workers. Because everybody was panicky. Completely convinced that the end was upon them. The advance, the communist victory, would be at any moment. The government people had no intention of working. Everybody was trying to figure out how they were going to get out of this hornet's nest. Ziem had been appointed by Bao Dai, the playboy emperor picked by the French. He had few allies in South Vietnam. An austere Catholic, he had gone to America in the early 1950s and secluded himself in a New Jersey seminary, Father John Keegan. He was a mysterious kind of person because we didn't know quite exactly what he was all about. He didn't seem to us to be very important. He did dishes with us, uh, and people of importance didn't do that. Students did that, or brothers did that, and he was ZM, you know, doing dishes at the tables with uh, the rest of the students. We were impressed with his devoutness. As seminarians, we were up at 5.30 in the morning, and, and ZM would already be in a pew, meditating, uh, reflecting. He would attend mass every morning, uh, you know, quite devoutly, as far as we could see, and stay afterwards and pray. Uh, it was almost as though he were living the life of a monk. By the fall of 1954, refugees from the north, most of them Catholics, were fleeing towards the south. Many had worked with the French and they feared communist reprisals. Many expected that Ziem, a Catholic, would favor them. About 900,000 Catholics under their village, Catholic priests moved from north to south. There was only a handful of people that moved from south to north to get away from the ZM government. These refugees were settled by parishes in areas that were prepared for them by the South Vietnamese government. But they remained as Catholic enclaves and very much as the Southerners, following our Civil War, objected to the carpetbaggers that came from the North and took over a good many of the political posts in the South. So also, the South Vietnamese strongly objected to the ZM adherents who came South. The refugees added to the confusion in the South, but Washington saw their value as a solid anti-communist base for ZM and as touching symbols of the Cold War. Newsreels of the day praised and publicized the exodus. Inevitably, there was the plight of the homeless refugees. Here again were tens and hundreds of thousands who chose freedom to living in communist rule territory. Our Navy pitched in with a giant sea lift history's largest mass civilian withdrawal by sea. And by every means of transportation, the flight from tyranny, civilization could but pause to admire the righteous will that drives man away from bondage to the freedoms of thought and way of life. American agents assigned to the North used propaganda to spur the migration. Their chief, a veteran CIA specialist, was Colonel Edward Lansdale. Some people were very reluctant about leaving home, so that the efforts on the propaganda were informative and also uh, uh, so, sort of urging them or, or nudging them real hard to come to a decision quickly because uh, there would be a period when uh, free movement wouldn't be permitted. So the orders to these people started turning into uh, sharper and sharper uh, form to get them to move and to, uh, to overcome their uh, reluctance in a, at a time of great demoralization of the people. The Geneva Accords allowed one year of free movement between the two halves of Vietnam. As the deadline approached, 
Refugees, panicked by propaganda from both sides, rioted at the port of Haiphong. To signal the growing American commitment to Xiem, President Eisenhower dispatched a new special envoy, his World War II colleague, General J. Lawton Collins. Collins, instructed to help train an army for Xiem, recommended $100 million in aid for the new government. Well, when I arrived in Saigon, it was chaotic. There's no question about that. The very day that I arrived, the chief of staff of the Vietnamese army, Hien, was inveighing against Xiem over a radio that was supported, as a matter of fact, by U.S. aid. All through the night, command cars, machine gun carriers, and army armored cars drove around and around the government palace. Well, I put a stop to that right off the bat, I can assure you. Hin said that uh, he was going to stay on, and he hinted that he would start a rebellion. I assured him that if he did that, then all military aid to Vietnam would cease. And so, finally, by putting pressure on Hin, I got him to leave town in, oh, in about a week. And he, as a matter of fact, he never returned again. More challengers emerged from the chaos of South Vietnamese politics. Two of them headed armed religious factions. Another, backed by the French, was a former river pirate, now a notorious gangster and opium dealer. Bai Vien was his name. He controlled the, the secret police, mind you, of Vietnam. He also controlled all the houses of prostitution and the gambling joints and this was the source of his strength. Bai Vien tried to make a deal with Xiem, but Xiem refused. In open defiance of the powerful gangster, he staged a symbolic burning of opium pipes. Then he attacked Bai Vien's headquarters, located in Saigon's central police station. Xiem's challenge seemed nearly suicidal to Collins, but Lansdale, now Xiem's closest American advisor, believed in him. Xiem was laughing at me. Uh, we were out on the front porch, and he said, you were standing about where I think the first shell is going to hit, and it's going to be coming in in about 20 minutes, and you'd better get out of here, and I'm not initiating. I'm receiving here. And sure enough, 20 months later, the, the firing broke out against him. Bai Vien's private army fought Xiem's troops through the streets of Saigon. The risks for Xiem were enormous. Unless he could consolidate his power, he would lose American support. He had already lost Collins. I liked Xiem, but I became convinced that he did not have the political knack nor the strength of character politically to manage this bizarre collection of people in, in, in uh, Vietnam. We have called uh, General Collins back here, a man in whom uh, we've had, uh, have the greatest confidence and who has been right in the thick of things out there and who has been uh, supporting, of course, Premier Diem. Now, uh, there have occurred lots of difficulties. People have left the cabinet and so on. You know what most of those difficulties are. It's a strange and it's uh, almost an inexplicable situation, at least from our viewpoint. Xiem prevailed. Blocks of Saigon lay in ruins, but he had crushed his enemies. Their surrender was a personal triumph for him, but it set a dangerous pattern. Distrustful and stubborn, Xiem would never compromise. He would confront and defy all opposition. And the government of Xiem, which seemed to be uh, almost on the ropes uh, a, a few weeks ago, I think is reestablished uh, with strength. Vietnam is now a free nation, at least the southern half of it is, and it's not got a puppet government. 
It's not got a government that we can give orders to and tell what we want it to do or we want it to refrain from doing. If it was that kind of a government, we wouldn't be justified in supporting it. In the early days, just after his uh, installation, when he took over, we had this group of Americans, all of whom had tremendous ideas of how to further uh, uh, the efforts of the country, of how to get this thing rolling, of how to uh, get the country started, get the government organized and formed and going. Here you have a president of the old cloth who is uh, quite formal, but having to put up with uh, an endless stream of Americans taking up his time. He didn't want to go out into the countryside. He didn't feel that the Vietnamese wanted to touch him and see him and be up close in the American style. We convinced him that he was not too well known and that Ho Chi Minh was very well known by everybody and therefore he should uh, build up his popularity. He made a series of long trips throughout the countryside, got big uh, receptions. There was of course an organized clack to get them enthusiastic. And he began to believe in this, that this was a good public relation ploy, that he could succeed in being a popular president. Ho Chi Minh's followers believed the countrywide elections in 1956 would bring them to power in a reunified Vietnam. They had withdrawn their troops from the South, but the Geneva Agreements allowed their political organizers to remain there and rally support for Ho. I and my family were very happy and supportive of the Geneva Agreement because we believed that there would not be any reprisal against the people who regrouped to the north and those who remained behind. And we thought that in two years we would have a free and fair election in which the people could freely choose their own government. The U.S. had opposed the Geneva Agreements but pledged to respect them. Diem, who had condemned the Accords, now resisted the nationwide election. Dulles had to decide what to do. He sat very quietly, we all sat very quietly. I can recall distinctly the clock ticking away on his wall and his breathing heavily as he read through the paper, turning to us, uh, the few of us who were there at that meeting, and saying, I don't believe Jem wants to hold elections. I believe we should support him in this. There's this about it, at that time, we had a dictator that was now controlling more than half the country and uh, with a great deal of his population, and he would get 100% of the vote. The Americans and Diem carried the day. There were no countrywide elections. Vietnam remained divided, and Washington welcomed Diem as a hero. You have exemplified in your corner of the world patriotism of the highest order. You have brought to your great task of organizing your country the greatest of courage, the greatest of statesmen. You are indeed welcome. Without American support, Ziem would never have survived. With it, he seemed to have done the impossible. Washington held him up to the world as a model of anti-communism, the miracle man of Asia. I think most Americans who came there and uh, fell in love with Vietnam, uh, fell in love with the Vietnamese, found themselves in a political situation, the likes of which they had never encountered, felt that the answers to Vietnam's problems were in some way comparable to the American experience. As a result of the government's request, Michigan State has sent a large group of civil police administrators from our own police administration school drawn from throughout the country for that matter to assist the civil police forces of Vietnam get on top of this serious situation. I think many Americans when they see pictures such as these or hear discussions of the civil guard in countries such as Vietnam uh, get somewhat the wrong impression. They get the, press, the impression that necessarily a police state is being created but uh, this is not true uh, and uh, these forces can be used to 
to bring greater freedom and greater security to the countryside and give the people greater opportunities to develop in the way they want to develop themselves. But South Vietnam relied almost totally on American aid. Diem welcomed the weapons and the dollars, but he often resisted the Americans' advice. He was polite, but he was rigid and proud and fiercely nationalistic. I think he looked upon us as great big children, well-intentioned, powerful, with a lot of technical know-how, but not very sophisticated in dealing with, uh, with him uh, or his race or his country's problems. During the late 1950s, Diem's problems grew. Like a traditional Vietnamese Mandarin, he drew his small circle closer around him, relying on his family, especially his brother Ngo Dien Nhu and Nhu's wife. Their secret police, run by Nhu, set out to eliminate communists and other dissidents. After the Viet Minh army regrouped to the north, and the Xiem regime took over the South, repression began. Those of us who had directly fought against the French and people who had helped organize the resistance against them were the special targets of Xiem's revenge. The manners of tortures inflicted upon these people by Ngo Din Ziem and his hound dogs, this was our term for the secret police, were extremely inhumane. We were not Catholics, we only worshipped our ancestors. And so they forced us to throw the altar to the ancestors away and to become Catholics and to denounce the communists. They had. Uh, in some provinces, uh, eliminated most of the stay-behind political agents, the ones that exposed themselves and proselytized the people and began to complain uh, against the government. But in doing this, with this heavy-handed police apparatus that he had set up, they also harmed and incarcerated and eliminated a lot of people who were not uh, uh, involved with the communist movement. <laughs> As the Americans and Xiam became more and more repressive, people started telling us we'd have to fight. They said we'd be wiped out if we kept to our plan of just political struggle. This film marked a new phase of the struggle in the South, the formation in 1960 of the National Liberation Front, a communist organized coalition of anti ZM forces. Denied the election promised at Geneva and nearly destroyed by ZM and News Police, the communist leadership and its southern supporters decided to go back to war. It would be, they said, a war of national liberation against Xiem and against the American presence in Vietnam. You will not be able to strangle the voice of the people, which roars out and will go on sounding. Down with colonialism. The sooner we bury it, and the deeper, the better. At the UN, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev encouraged wars of national liberation. The new president took over in an atmosphere of grave threats and confrontation between East and West. John Kennedy was in office only a few months when he suffered a humiliating defeat at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Communist leader Fidel Castro crushed a secret American plan to oust him and then paraded his prisoners for the world to see. The invasion planning had begun before Kennedy took office, and Eisenhower joined him during the crisis. Soon, a badly shaken Kennedy faced questions on another war of national liberation, 
in Vietnam. The problem of troops uh, is a matter uh, that, uh, and the matter of what we're going to do uh, to assist uh, Vietnam to retain its independence is a matter still under consideration. There are a good many which I think can most usefully wait till we've had consultation with the government, which uh, up to the present time, uh, which will be one of the matters which uh, uh, Vice President Johnson will deal with the problem of consultations with the government of Vietnam as to what further steps could most usefully be taken. Kennedy sent his Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, to Saigon to reassure Diem. The U.S. seemed to be faltering, and Diem was worried. Johnson performed like a Texas politician on the campaign trail. Tell him that in the battle uh, for Britain, when the clouds were over uh, the little island, uh, of uh, uh, England. Churchill said, we'll fight him in the alleys, in the streets. Uh. On his tour around Saigon, Vice President Johnson has stopped his motorcade. He talks to just about anybody around. Now he's taking a ride in what's known as a pedicab. Johnson really enjoys this kind of thing. Nothing phases him, he tries everything. President Kennedy was determined on this one because of a number of early setbacks, the Bay of Pigs to begin, the dressing down, in effect, that he got from Khrushchev in the Vienna conference when, he first, when they first met each other, uh, and finally the Berlin Wall. So Vietnam was the point. Kennedy and his men saw themselves in a struggle with Khrushchev for the loyalty of new nations. To them, national liberation was code for communist aggression. South Vietnam is already under attack, sometimes by a single assassin, sometimes by a band of guerrillas, recently by full battalions. The peaceful borders of Burma, Cambodia, and India have been repeatedly violated, and the peaceful people of Laos are in danger of losing the independence they gained not so long ago. No one can call these wars of liberation, for these are free countries living under their own governments. Nor are these aggressions any less real because men are knifed in their homes and not shot in the field of battle. In October 1961, two key Kennedy advisors, General Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow arrived in Vietnam. Their visit coincided with a serious flood. They recommended a big increase in military aid, including U.S. combat troops disguised as flood fighters. Diem said no to the troops. He needed U.S. support, but he wanted to keep control, and he wanted to keep the foreigners out. He feared an overwhelming American influence. That was one of the reasons he didn't want American combat forces. Uh, he was, to my mind, prescient in, in, in this. Um, said, in effect, he thought it would be a bonanza for the Viet Cong. Kennedy, too, was reluctant to send ground troops, but he wanted to be tough. The answer for little wars, guerrilla wars like South Vietnam's, was counterinsurgency. Special forces like the Green Berets were sent to train the troops of threatened countries. They went in small numbers, but they brought with them the best of American military technology. Counterinsurgency was stylish and exciting, and it suited JFK's needs perfectly. One of its strongest proponents was Kennedy aide Roger Hillsman. My idea was that the role of the special forces were to train Vietnamese to behave as guerrillas, harassing the supply lines down through the mountains of the, uh, the Viet Cong. And the special, American special forces were to train their special forces to do that. The communist-led movement in the South, now termed the Viet Cong, had made big gains in 1961. With increased U.S. aid and the new counterinsurgency program, Kennedy raised America's ante. 
He could win this limited war with a few American advisors, a lot of American hardware, and a positive attitude. I feel that uh, being humble and putting yourself in their position uh, is a way to do it. Uh, I have gone out and uh, helped them pick watermelons. I walk around uh, with my bodyguard, uh, he and I, and we go visit them and drink tea with them in the houses, uh, in their house. And this, this is an oddity to them because they, they can't imagine that an American can put himself in this position. Uh, so therefore, it's going to be the man who can give them the most, uh, show them that they can support them better, that will win their confidence and win their support. And as you know, it's the man who gets the support of this farmer who is going to eventually win this war. Absolute loyalty to the fatherland and the president of the Republic of Vietnam. We swear to sacrifice ourselves to defend our country and the personalist Republic regime. The ceremonies hid widening cracks inside the regime. In early 1962, two of Ziem's own Air Force officers bombed the palace, hoping to topple the tightly knit ruling family. Madame Nhu was injured. Just next to me was a bomb that had fallen. It was fat like this, just like a little pig. It hadn't exploded, it was just there. And I was just there too. Are you afraid of death? Me? Oh no, not at all. Because in my country, death is always just around the corner. If you're afraid of it, you can't do anything. The Viet Cong had assassinated 500 civilians and Ziem officials and killed 1,500 of his troops in the first half of 1961. VC influence in the countryside was growing. Ziem's brother, Nhu, encouraged by U.S. advisors, promoted a program to isolate peasants from the guerrillas. He ordered the construction of thousands of fortified villages, strategic hamlets. We are building strategic hamlets to bring peace throughout the country. This was their motto and their code of faith. Volunteers from every class and age, men and women and children, began the hard physical work of construction. First, they broke arable land to make the deep moats and the high fences. First came the moat around the entire village. The bamboo spikes making an ancient but thoroughly efficient protection against invaders have become the trademark of the strategic hamlets and each spike is cut and set by willing hands. In reality, life inside the spiky perimeter didn't measure up to the ideal. Ziem's half-hearted land reform in the 50s had failed and now the already resentful farmers were forced to relocate to the hamlets, which were targets for Viet Cong attacks. Defense Secretary McNamara toured some hamlets with Ambassador Nolting in May 1962. Though American officials had private reservations about the program, McNamara publicly praised it. The Americans were trying to be optimistic. Major, how would you say the war was going in your sector? Well, I think here lately, the, that's going a lot better. I think we're beginning to, to win the people over. Our operations are, are going better. We're, we're actually getting VC. Uh, what evidence do you have that the, you're winning the people over? Well, we've got this strategic hamlet program uh, going on. When we go out on these operations, uh, it seems like the people are more friendly. Several times recently we've had people uh, warn 
the Vietnamese troops that there was an ambush ahead or something like that. This means the people are getting on our side. It was just a year ago that you ought to have stepped up aid to Vietnam. There seems to be a good deal of discouragement about the progress. Can you give us your assessment? No, we are putting in a major effort in Vietnam. As you know, we have, uh, have about 10 or 11 times as many men there as we had a year ago. They are, uh, we've had a uh, number of casualties. We put in an awful lot of equipment. We're going ahead with the strategic hamlet proposal. In some phases, the military program has been uh, quite successful. There is great difficulty, however, in fighting a guerrilla war. You need 10 to 1 or 11 to 1, especially in terrain as difficult as South Vietnam. But I'm, uh, so we're not, uh, we don't see the end of the tunnel, but uh, I must say, I don't think it's uh, darker than it was a year ago, in some ways lighter. But there was rising opposition to Diem's government, especially to his brother Nhu, who controlled the secret police and an elaborate intelligence network. Brilliant and eccentric, Nhu was at war not only with the communists, but with all critics of the regime. My husband, he was very unhappy. With, um, on one side, his brother, the other side, uh, his wife. He considered um, both of us as babes, babes in the woods. He said to his brother, you, you should be a monk, and you, uh, to me, just, just keep quiet. Don't say anything. Vietnam had been a concern to the Kennedy administration, but it was not a major concern. Suddenly, in the spring of 1963, it became a crisis. Buddhist groups protesting that Tiem's soldiers had killed eight worshippers while breaking up a gathering in Hue began a series of demonstrations. At first, Ziem and his family did not take the Buddhists seriously. My brother Ziem, the president, never stopped giving aid and good advice to the Buddhists. He used to say to them, try to do something to reorganize your religion. As it is now, just about anyone can say he's a good Buddhist. All he has to do is shave his head and eyebrows and put on a robe. As the demonstrations grew, Ziem rejected compromise and met the challengers with force. A Buddhist monk, Te Quang Duc, countered with a traditional act that horrified the West. The Reverend Quang Duc decided to dedicate his body as a torch to light the struggle to preserve religious teaching. I saw him step out of his car and assume the lotus position. Then a monk stepped forward and helped the reverend pour gasoline on himself. At that moment, a flame engulfed his body. The photos hit the front pages in America and were on Kennedy's desk in the morning. Quang Duc had become a martyr. Saigon students joined the Buddhists and the protests against Ziem exploded. During the Reverend Quang Duc's cremation, everything was burned except for his heart which remained intact. His heart was set on fire two more times, but it still did not burn. What have the Buddhist leaders done comparatively? The only thing they have done, they have uh, barbecued, one of their monks, uh, whom they have intoxicated, whom they have abused the confidence. And even that barbecuing was done um, not even with self-sufficient means, because they, they used uh, imported uh, gasoline. The Buddhist uh, bit, tasted a little political blood, bit harder, tasted more political blood, 
and then finally began to use American television. They would, uh, none of them spoke English, but their signs were all in English. And every time they planned a demonstration or a Buddhist burned himself to death, they would call up the American press and they would appear. And uh, so they, they learned to use the American press media for political purposes. They learned how to develop political power as they went along. The Buddhist affair and the problems with the students were set up and orchestrated in such a way as to intoxicate public opinion here at home and abroad against the government of South Vietnam. Because this government fights the communists and because it refuses to be a puppet government. In the convulsive summer of 1963, events raced far beyond Washington's control. The Buddhist became the rallying point for long simmering opposition to Ziem. Alarmed, Ziem's senior army officers began to talk of ousting him. Ambassador Nolting stood by Ziem. I never felt that President Ziem was a prisoner of his own family or of any particular group, Roman Catholic or any other. I felt that he had a very difficult job to govern the country in a way which would not permit the Viet Cong to take over. But Hillsman and others in Washington had decided that Ziem and you should go. Ambassador Nolting, Ziem's ally, returned home. The new ambassador was Henry Cabot Lodge, a Republican. Kennedy wanted bipartisan company in the Vietnam crisis. When Ambassador Lodge came to Saigon, he let everybody know who was in charge, and he was the boss. And you better execute his orders without hesitation or murmuring, or you were out. Ziem and New struck again at the Buddhists even before Lodge reached Saigon. New's special forces raided the temples, sealed them shut, and arrested thousands of Buddhists. Ziem's generals, increasingly frustrated, started to plot against the government. In the Vietnamese army, a majority of the soldiers were Buddhists. I am a Buddhist. I had a lot of trouble with my family, who reproached me for having attacked the pagodas. But it wasn't true. People were saying that the army staged the attacks, but actually, it was units loyal to Ziem who attacked the pagodas. But that doesn't matter. We were equally responsible. So then we had to do something to show Ziem. Either he had to change his policies, or we would have to change Mr. Ziem. I talked to specifically to General Don, uh, and I talked to other generals, and then this is the first indication that I had that there was really something serious going on, that there was actually a, a coup, so to speak, being thought of by the senior officers of the Vietnamese Army. The U.S. was now spending a million and a half dollars a day on the war. There were 16,000 American soldiers in South Vietnam, still called advisors, but inevitably seeing action. The growing crisis in the cities threatened the Ziem government and the whole war effort. The generals, through Konin, secretly asked Lodge for American support in their plot to topple Ziem. Suspecting a coup, Ziem and Yu declared martial law. Lodge cabled Washington for instructions. The prospect of a coup split the Kennedy ranks, but four top advisors took the initiative, cabling Lodge to tell Ziem to get rid of New. If Ziem refused, Lodge could tell the generals to go ahead. 
I brought up this question of getting new out of the country, and he uh, absolutely refused to discuss any of the things that I was instructed to discuss. And uh, it gave me a little jolt, frankly. I think that when an ambassador goes to call on a chief of state and he has been instructed by the president to bring up certain things, uh, the chief of state ought to at least talk about them. Without him, the president would not be, I don't think that he, it would be easy for him to, to rule the country, to govern the country. That's why when it was, uh, uh, it was requested, uh, he was requested to, to send away my husband. <laughs> he, he said, uh, it was an absolutely a, a, a stupid uh, demand because he, he knew very well that my husband can do without him, but he, he could not do without my husband. The Buddhists continued their protests And the tensions in Saigon now reverberated in Washington, where Kennedy still had doubts about a coup. The president wavered. Then, in a television interview, he sent a subtle but sharp signal to Ziem. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them, we can give them equipment, we can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. We're prepared to continue to assist them, but I don't think that the war can be won unless the people support the effort. And in my opinion, in the last two months, the government has gotten out of touch with the people. Do you think that this government still has time to regain the I support do. of the people? With changes uh, in policy and uh, perhaps with, uh, in personnel, I think it can. If it doesn't uh, make those changes, I would think that the chances of winning it would not be very good. We wanted to be certain that if we succeeded with the coup, we would have American support afterward, that the Americans agreed with us, because we needed their aid to continue the war. I asked Conin what the Americans thought. He said, yes, the Americans agree. I don't have any files on the dates of the conversation or anything like that. So I don't really know at what point I know that I gave them a green light prior to the coup upon the instruction of my government. Madame New toured America trying to rally support for the beleaguered regime. At the same time, New hinted that he might make a deal with the communists. I am an anti-communist from the point of view of doctrine. I am not an anti-communist from the point of view of politics or humanity. I consider the communists as brothers, lost sheep. I am not for a crusade against the communists because we are a little country, and we only want to live in peace. On October 26th, Vietnam's National Day, Diem reviewed the troops. Yeah, he knew that a coup was being planned, uh, and he was, I bet you he had every, uh, every possible resource that he had at his disposal out trying to find out where they were and, and how to how to destroy it. Lodge, through Conin, had signaled his approval of the general's plan. But suspecting a double cross, the generals refused to reveal the date for the coup. It began on November 1st. And it was just a little after one when we heard the first uh, shell go off. And then we went up onto the roof and you could see the planes dropping bombs uh, and you could uh, you could see the troops starting to come down the street, and uh, the thing was really on. Do you remember what your own feeling was at seeing all that? Well, my own feeling... Uh, well, I've sort of been living with it for, uh, for, for many, uh, several weeks. 
So I, wasn't, I can't say I was surprised, but of course you're always, it's always a very interesting thing to see, see people shooting. He telephoned me it's about four o'clock and he said they've started the coup and he said, I want to know what the attitude of the United States government is. Well, I said, it's four o'clock in the morning in Washington, and I just, I don't know what the attitude is. Oh, he said, you must have an idea. No, I said, I haven't, but I said, I'm very uh, alarmed about your personal safety, and I have taken steps uh, so that you can be made titular chief of state in a, in a new government, or that uh, uh, you can be flown uh, out of the country to some uh, safe place, or else, I said, I, I offer you asylum here in the residence. And he said, uh, no, he said, I'm going to restore order. Will you seek political asylum in this country if the coup is successful? Never. Why? No, because I, I cannot stay in a country of people who have stabbed me. My government in, in time of war. What news do you have of your At husband? At first, I do not think that it will succeed. You can be sure that I am sure that it will never succeed. Yeah. News for my husband? Yeah. I know I know only that he expected the coup. All right, you we'll know, have to break it up now. Yeah. What of his welfare? Is he all right? Is he all right? November 2nd, 1963. the 8.20 a.m. spot, the 99.9 .9 FM spot. This is AFRS Radio in Saigon. The time now is 1 o'clock. The American ambassador and the commander military assistance command announced that all Americans are cautioned that a curfew from 20 hundred hours last night to 0, 0700 hours this morning is in effect for the Saigon Cholon Jiadin area. For their own safety, Americans should stay off the streets unless movement is absolutely necessary for conduct of official business. At 3.30 on the morning of November 2nd, the generals' infantry and tanks began their assault on the palace. When they broke through, Ziem and Niu were gone. I tell you that if really the Mo family have been treacherously killed, in that effect will be only the beginning, the beginning of the story. As the soldiers sacked the palace, the generals searched for Ziem and Niu. Finally, they made contact, and General Min, called Big Min, dispatched a convoy to get them. One of the group who'd gone to get the two brothers, a general named Mai Hu Swan, came to the door of the office, saluted, and said to Big Men, mission accomplished. Within minutes after he was killed, I, I got the word. And what... He, 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 he and his brother left the palace, the Jialong Palace, and went in this underground uh, passageway to this Chinese merchant's house in Sholan, the Chinese section of, of Saigon. And in the morning, they went into the uh, Roman Catholic Chinese church. And when they came out, there were armed men and an armored car, and they were pushed into the armored car and, sh I believe, shot inside the armored car. In a very real sense, the ultimate responsibility for the coup lay with President No Dinh Diem because he did things that we told him over and over and over again, that if he did them, we would have to publicly disapprove of them, and that this would encourage a coup, and he said, I know. Now, he went ahead and did them, 
and we had to publicly disapprove of them. There was no choice. But all that is, um, how do you say, arrogance, comes from arrogance. The U.S. was convinced it possessed the truth and was full of contempt. My own view was that even at that point, uh, we would have done much better to stick with the constitutional government or at the very least to have let them know uh, that our policy was changing. I don't think it was fair, just, or honorable to an ally of nine years uh, to do this behind his back. John F. Kennedy's government had been complicit in Xiem's overthrow, and that complicity deepened America's involvement in Southeast Asia. But Kennedy's death in Dallas only three weeks later overshadowed the assassinations in Saigon. It was left for the new president to discover what Kennedy and Eisenhower and Xiem had created in South Vietnam. In 1964 and 65, President Lyndon Johnson led America to a larger war in Vietnam. How did Johnson make the fateful decision to raise the U.S. troop level to nearly 200,000? Who urged him on? And who tried to hold him back? LBJ goes to war, next on Vietnam.